Did you know that some people can develop diabetes even if they aren't overweight? Did you also know that it has been debated if diabetes can be set into remission long term? Well, a researcher that has made it his mission to discover exactly why normal weight people develop diabetes, as well as help them reverse their diabetes, released a study to explore both situations. So we'll dive into the study results describing long-term diabetes remission. And I'll go ahead and mention that if you have type two diabetes, time is of the essence because certain nuances make these results accurate for some and false hope for others. We'll get into those specifics, don't worry. The researchers recruited 40 individuals with half already having diabetes, but what was unique about these participants is that they aren't overweight, which is typical for much of the diabetic population, implying a unique situation with these individuals. It's been previously described as a low personal fat threshold, meaning in incredibly brief terms, these individuals' liver is overburdened with fat, which leads to an overwhelmed pancreas as more fat is exported from the liver in VLDL particles containing fat to the pancreas. Ultimately, the pancreas, which would normally release insulin to clear blood sugar, blood glucose, becomes less and less able. There's a lot I'm glossing over here, but I have a separate video going over all the physiology and cellular mechanisms, so I'll link that for you. What you need to know for this story, however, is that some people accumulate much more fat in their liver than others, leading to blood sugar dysregulation, insulin resistance, at much lower body fat, and making people more prone to diabetes at a low body weight. But what we know from these people in the study is that they definitely have type 2 diabetes. Next, these individuals had a series of baseline measures taken of them to get an accurate starting point. From there, they were put on a strict calorie cycling diet. We'll get into the specifics of how they did it in just a bit. First, the results. Okay, so if the people are strictly calorie cycling, ultimately, we'd expect weight loss, at least at a bare minimum. Is that what we actually see? Looking at the data, we see weight in kilograms on the vertical axis, and we see the length of time in the study on the horizontal axis. So zero here is the starting point, baseline. The N at the bottom is the number of participants measured, and the P is the statistical p-value. Anything under 0.05 is considered statistically significant versus the baseline value. Remember, that's a zero. As we can see, these individuals certainly lost body weight, starting at something like, I don't know, 72 kilograms and ending up in the low 60s after 52 weeks. You might also be wondering what the dotted line is. That's the control group, meaning the other 20 participants involved in the study were normal weight individuals without diabetes. However, there is a drawback of this control. I'll discuss that too in just a bit. But we know that the diabetic group was able to drop their body weight to roughly around the control group's body weight. We see the same results looking at body fat. I won't go over all the explanation again, but you can clearly see a drop in body fat from the zero mark to the 24 and 52 week mark. Okay, all well and good, but we mostly care about, you know, the diabetes. So what's the deal? When we look at diabetic measures, we can look at a variety of markers, like just looking at blood sugar levels circulating in your vasculature, but that tends to be an incomplete picture of our physiology. So we can lean on more long-term markers of elevated blood sugar called glycated hemoglobin, which is represented by HbA1c data. Glycated hemoglobin is the literal attachment of sugar molecules, glycation, to a protein found in our red blood cells called hemoglobin. If more sugar is around, the odds of getting this glycation reaction is high. And since red blood cells aren't recycled for several months, it gives scientists and clinicians an excellent look into your past. So looking at that HbA1c data, we can clearly see a drop, but importantly, even one year later, the improvement persists. Now, a few things to point out here by just looking at the data. One, the HbA1c of around 54 millimoles per mole is considered diabetic. So they clearly started out diabetic. See time zero again. 
Being considered non-diabetic is anything below 48 millimole per mole. So you could argue that after eight weeks only, these individuals had set their diabetes into remission. But that also doesn't mean that they were in the healthy range, which is typically below 36 millimoles. So while I would love to tell you about complete diabetic remission is proven here, it simply isn't. What this indicates is that you can push diabetes back into pre-diabetic values, but there's also no evidence here that complete remission is possible. If we look at the data again, notice how the researchers no longer add that dotted line for the control. That's because it would be below the lowest value on the vertical axis, probably well below 40 here. I'll add that the blood sugar values, although less reliable, indicate the same effect. But all in all, why is this the case? Weren't we promised diabetes remission? Well, we're never promised anything in science. We're promised results, but we may not like the results. Still, there is still some context to be applied here. According to the same researcher, the effectiveness of diabetes remission is highly dependent on the length of time that a person has diabetes. So the less time has elapsed since diagnosis, the better, because a diabetic condition can wreak havoc on the cells of the pancreas. I cover that too in the personal fat threshold video that I'll be linking for you. So the likelihood of complete remission returning to normal blood sugar regulation, even better than pre-diabetic, is inversely related to the length of time as a diabetic, aka the longer you are diabetic, the lower the chance of complete remission. This is why I was hinting earlier that time is of the essence. However, as the scientific review points out, there are exceptions to the rule, as these scientists have even seen a select few people with diabetes for over 20 years still achieve remission. Just that to set yourself up in the best scenario, the earlier, the better. Now, one last positive. 70% of those that experienced remission in this study, we'll call it a partial remission, did so without need for any diabetic medications, which is remarkable. Now, before we get to exactly how these people achieve this diabetes remission, which was far easier than expected, and before we get to some of the details on the control group, there's also a lot more information on liver health, including metabolism and senescence markers, FGF21 and GDF15, and learning an early stage marker of long-term diabetes remission. If you're interested in that, just join the Physionic Insiders where you'll have access to the extended version of this video and all my videos, including many other perks. The link to join is below. Would love to have you aboard. Okay, one quick critique of the control group here before moving on. The control group was only measured at one point in the study. You could think of them as a, as a reference group, but not a traditional control group that goes through the same diet regimen as the diabetic individuals. So it falls short as a true control. However, in my estimation, it probably doesn't matter. The results would likely be the same, but it's still important to point out. Now, how exactly did the researchers send diabetes into remission for these individuals? As I mentioned before, the participants were placed on a calorie cycling diet, but let's dig into exactly how they executed that. First, everyone consumed only 800 calories a day for cycles of two to four weeks, whatever they could handle. The diet composition was largely fruits and vegetables, consuming around 180 gram portion of fruit per day, two to three 80 gram portions of vegetables per day, and they consumed most of their fat as monounsaturated fat, equating to about 40 to 50 grams of total fat a day, plus 55 to 60 grams of protein per day. But my educated guess is that the macronutrient distributions don't matter nearly as much as the 800 calorie target. Now, to be clear, the participants did not achieve 800 calories every day. Sometimes they went over by a few hundred calories, but as long as they aimed for it, they still achieved benefits. I'm pretty confident that any nutritional plan with adequate healthful protein and fat will yield similar results so long as the calorie requirement is met. 
Beyond that, the minimum duration was two weeks in a row of this dieting. Then they were allowed to return to maintenance for four to six weeks, which was adjusted based on if they started gaining weight. Then after four to six weeks, they'd go on another two to four weeks of this low calorie cycling. They repeated this two to three times over the year and achieved the results that we witnessed here. You know how I didn't want to get into the mechanisms and the physiology of why people who aren't overweight still develop diabetes? Well, I go into all of that in detail in this video. If you're interested in diabetes and disease, it's an eye opener. Highly recommended. Thanks for watching.